Bill Stout with Bob Sharp at the McDonald plant in St. Louis. Bob, can you give us any idea of what they saw as they sat there in those seconds while the engines began and then were shut down? Uh, yes, on this forward part of the panel, we have a malfunction detection system. Uh, the needles here, the two on the left side, uh, indicate pressures in the uh, stage one uh, fuel and oxidizer tank of the booster. Uh, over here on the right-hand side, we have the stage two uh, tanks, which give similar pressure indications. We never got to those, though. Uh, we never got to those. Uh, so what happens is that uh, we have also two engine one lights. These are for the two uh, Aerojet uh, engines on the uh, first stage of the booster. These engine the lights are uh, illuminated red uh, prior to start. And then as soon as the engine comes up to uh, normal power range, the uh, lights will go out indicating a normal engine. Then uh, they should stay out then all through the uh, liftoff and the first stage of burning where they come on again at staging, which is a normal uh, engine shutdown. The uh, thing that Shira noticed evidently is that uh, within this uh, three to four second time period before liftoff occurred, evidently the plug must have fall fallen out and started his event timer, which would uh, make it run up here prematurely and he noticed that cut it uh, caught it in time and uh, uh, shut down the engine also another indication that comes to him is the word liftoff which is uh, given to them over the uh, communication system from the uh, uh, blockhouse control so uh, he used this system to uh, analyze the situation and uh, uh, act perfectly uh, some of the other things that he would have seen had liftoff occurred would be say on the attitude ball the uh, needles uh, which are now intersected in the middle and uh, right here which intersect in the middle and are uh, uh, indicative of the rates that the uh, or the rate of movement that the uh, uh, booster is experiencing uh, would also be steady here before liftoff and after liftoff you notice minute deviations of these needles so uh, he took all of these into account and made the correct decision on this shutdown very very quickly indeed could it be bob that uh, as sometimes happens with uh, airliners the warning symptoms came through but there was really nothing wrong um it's a possibility, although it sounds like if this uh, uh, plug or connector fell out, well, that is something wrong. And uh, like uh, Waller said a while ago, we do learn a lot uh, by our experiences. You can bet your bottom dollar that uh, that'll be the last connector that'll fall out. <laughs> it's the <laughs> first one ever, isn't it? I believe so. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And uh, if it hadn't fallen out, then uh, maybe there's something that was uh, not right in the program that uh, we would have never discovered. In this case, uh, when you catch a malfunction, you always uh, know what uh, has failed in, and you can do something about it and make the program better and safer in the future. And that, Walter, is pretty much what they're doing down at the Cape, trying to find out exactly what did happen and correcting it in a hurry for a Thursday launch, we hope. Bill and Bob, uh, Bob, I, I sort of gathered from what you were saying there that uh, you're, you're suggesting that Shira initiated the engine shutdown after he read the indication uh, there from his instrument panel. Uh, is that what you meant to say? Uh, did no. I misread you? Uh, no. If uh, he had uh, interpreted his instruments wrong, he would have ejected uh, in that case. The uh, thing that he did was right was interpreting him right and uh, not ejecting. Right, right. I understood that, but we have been saying it was an automatic shutdown. I just wanted to be sure that uh, we were on the same beam here. The decision, right. was, the decision that he made was to stay in the spacecraft rather than blow out the hatches. Now that's right. The uh, thing is that with the automatic shutdown, the uh, engine lights come on red again there, which if uh, interpreted wrong there, uh, would show a, a uh, thrust failure. If this had happened right after liftoff, which normally uh, with the event timer running to indicate liftoff, and these lights coming on red it would be a certain ejection. This is the, this is the situation that he analyzed correctly. Right. Thank you. Uh, uh, just to recount, Gemini 6, uh, after ignition of its engines uh, were shut down, 
uh, had the mission scrubbed this morning at 9.54 and has been rescheduled for Thursday morning at 8.43. Bill Stout, you recorded a piece for us a little earlier I'd like to show now. It concerns one of the big concerns about the flight of Gemini 7, uh, the astronauts Frank and uh, Borman and Jim Lovell, uh, some concern that the job of flying their spacecraft for so long might tire them and thus endanger the rendezvous with the Gemini 6 space team. Several weeks ago, uh, you, Bill Stout, uh, talked about this with the astronaut's chief physician, Dr. Charles Berry. Do you see now, Dr. Berry, any levels of possible danger which might be reached at the 8th, 9th, or 10th day of the mission before rendezvous of the two spacecraft that might prompt you to call off the entire thing? Well, I think that uh, fatigue is one of the things that, that you mentioned that uh, we would, will certainly be watching for signs of this and discussing it with the crew too. Uh, we're going to be watching their uh, physiologic responses as far as heart rates are concerned and uh, I think the only thing that would really uh, cause us any uh, considerable worry here is if we were to see that uh, the heart was not responding as well to any demands made upon it as far as uh, work is concerned or if we were to see that uh, we were getting some uh, um, slow enough rates that we were beginning to get arrhythmias develop where we were getting a, a different heart rate uh, from than that initiated by its normal pacemaker, then I think we would certainly uh, give a lot of thought about whether we were going to continue the mission. And uh, I think those are the main things. It's a very difficult thing to say. We try and, and look ahead to plan all the things that could possibly happen. And uh, uh, then, then we try and still have to play it on a uh, real-time basis. And all these decisions are really things that you have to make real-time. And some of them you just can't write ground rules about. No one's ever done it before. That's right. It's an area no, where no one has been before. One of the problems uh, with uh, men in, cooped up in a spacecraft, a little area hardly the size of the front seat of a compact car, is how they get along together. And that's one of the things that, indeed, this two-week flight is meant to test, besides uh, the physical deterioration which may occur in a weightless state for that long, such as demineralization of the bones, the calcium loss from the bones, and the lazy heart that develops because the heart doesn't have to pump against gravity for that long a period. These are things that are being tested by this long, the longest flight yet by man, and uh, the longest that we have planned until we, indeed, uh, go to the moon or beyond. Even the moon flight won't be as long as this two-week one, probably. But uh, one of the problems is the psychological effect on the men. And yesterday, in a uh, briefing of newsmen down at Houston, uh, Chuck Berry said that although things were getting pretty rancid in that tiny spacecraft with those unwashed, unshaven men, uh, they had not yet uh, uh, begun to hate each other or anything like that. Apparently, they're getting along just fine. As a matter of fact, their sense of humor remains uh, intact. They've been uh, kidding with the ground station on almost every pass. Meanwhile, the ground station has been trying to keep them amused by piping music up to them. Classical numbers are their greatest choice, but they did get one requested by Lovell's 12-year-old daughter, Barbara, uh, yesterday or the day before. I saw Mama kissing Santa Claus. And Lovell uh, passed back the word that he'd seen Santa Claus before he took off for this mission, presumably an indication that he'd gotten his Christmas shopping done early. And today, uh, one of the sidebars uh, of this flight, uh, if uh, presumably once things have quieted down a bit after this disappointment over the failure to launch Gemini 6, uh, Borman and Lovell will hear a 15-minute uh, special communion service recorded for them by the Cathedral of St. James in Chicago with a special hymn written for them. They're both Episcopalians, and this will give them an opportunity for 15 minutes of church services 185 miles above the earth as they hurtle along at 17,500 miles an hour. Presumably another uh, first for our space program. They have not uh, talked to their wives uh, directly. It was decided, uh, oh, a couple of flights ago that uh, this uh, chit-chat with the wives from Mission Control would be cut out. 
and uh, they have not done so, but what uh, the Space Center has done instead is wire the homes of Borman and Lovell uh, with the uh, speaker system uh, right off of uh, manned Space Center control, Gemini control there, so they can at any time monitor these communications between the ground stations and their husbands. In other words, just tune them in and be sure they're getting along all right. That uh, tune, uh, I saw Mama Kissing Santa Claus, just might have been prompted by uh, maybe some hidden concern of Mrs. Lovell's uh, over the fact that when she and uh, Mrs. Borman sent a message up about uh, Christmas coming up and be sure to get back for Christmas, uh, Lovell came back and said, Bah humbug. Very shortly thereafter, Barbara was requesting I saw Mama kissing Santa Claus to be piped up to remind him that he better get back in time for Christmas. And they certainly will be. Their debriefing should be completed, and they should be home in Houston in plenty of time uh, for the big day. Meanwhile, they are circling the earth in their 120th run of Mrs. Lovell's uh, over the fact that when she and uh, Mrs. Borman sent a message up about uh, Christmas coming up and be sure to get back for Christmas, uh, Lovell came back and said, Bah humbug. Very shortly thereafter, Barbara was requesting, I saw Mama kissing Santa Claus to be piped up to remind him that he better get back in time for Christmas. And they certainly will be. Their debriefing should be completed, and they should be home in Houston in plenty of time uh, for the big day. Meanwhile, they are circling the earth in their 120th revolution. Uh, they're just out over the Indian Ocean, passing uh, between the Tanana Reeve Station and the uh, Carnarvon Australian Station. Uh, they have been up now eight days, and in an hour and, uh, let's see, an hour and 16 minutes, they will set a new record in space. We're holding on here to uh, in hopes that we can get uh, at least part of that news conference that will be held in Houston uh, to tell us about the events of this day and let the uh, space experts answer questions from the newsmen of the dramatic developments on pad 19 when the flight had to be called off this even after ignition. Control. Here's Houston Paul Haney in Houston. 189 hours, 39 minutes into the flight of seven. For your reference, the flight of Gemini 5, the record that will shortly be surpassed, was 190 hours, 56 minutes. And Chris Graff says we plan to give uh, 7 a special salute when they pass that point. Also, for your information, the project officials here at Houston and down at the Cape are still huddling. And uh, we expect that news conference at the Cape to start perhaps 15 to 20 minutes from now. Meanwhile, some information on city passes. The seven spacecraft should be viewable from these cities in, at these local times, all times local. We have a date on the, for Los Angeles on December 13, 6.52 a.m. Pacific Standard. On the 15th of December, 5.29 a.m. On the 16th, 5.34 on the 17th, 5.40 a.m., and on the 18th, 5.46 a.m. El Paso should be able to see the spacecraft on the 13th at 6.19 a.m., on the 14th at 6.35, again on the 15th, 6.31 a.m., local El Paso time, on the 16th, 6.37, on the 17th, two chances, 5.08 a.m., and 6.43 a.m., and on the 18th, two chances, 5.13 a.m., and 6.49 a.m. Houston should be able to see it on the 13th at 7.15 a.m., on the 14th at 5.52 a.m., on the 15th, 5.58, on the 16th, 6.04, on the 17th, 6.10 a.m., and on the 18th, 6.15 a.m. The Cape area should be able to see the spacecraft at, uh, on the 13th of December at 6.48 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, on the 14th at 5.30 a.m., also on the 14th, 6.54 a.m., 
on the 15th, two chances, 5.26 a.m. and 7 a.m. On the 16th, 5.32 and 7.07. .07. On the 17th, 5.37 a.m. And on the 18th, 5.43 a.m.